mean, I was going to ask you, what do you attribute to the the change in your viewers? Because when you look at how many people have viewed all of your videos, I mean, and you have some really cool stuff from your international travel. That was the stuff that I first watched. Yeah. Right. But then you switched to van life and these things took off like one video is a million and a half views, half a million, quarter of a million is pretty common for you. Yeah, I, you know, I think I just had really lucky timing. I, so everyone knows the RV industry has exploded. Mm -hmm. But when I got my R, when I ordered my RV, that hadn't happened yet. People, they actually weren't selling very many RVs when I bought mine in late March, early April, because they didn't know how coronavirus was going to impact consumers. They actually thought the opposite. They needed to get rid of them because, you know, as quick as they could, because people weren't going to have disposable income. And the exact opposite happened. Right when I bought my van, people started, you know, going on. Number one, people were at home. And number mm -hmm. two, people were like, I think I want to buy an RV so I can travel that way since I can't travel any other way. And people just started, you know, searching YouTube for, for that kind of stuff. And I just happened, I just happened to film um, a woman and her Airstream base yeah. camp the week that Airstream put out their new base camp. It wasn't intentional. I had no idea. Okay. And so they, they did a product launch for the base camp. And so everybody ran over to, um, ran over to YouTube and searched Airstream base camp. And my video was the, the number one trending video for that. So that really was the, the, uh, the catalyst that, you know, had my channel explode. Although I did two videos before that, that got like a quarter million views right away. The $5,500 van was probably one of the first ones that did the quarter of a million. Uh, yeah, that one. And my two, I did two videos, one where I did like my first 48 hours in the van and the, another one where I did a tour of my van right when I got it. Um, and the national park edition van that I have was relatively new. So a lot of people were searching that as well. Mm -hmm. So those videos did, um, pretty good right away Two 300,000 views. And I got like 12,000 subscribers off uh, that first video. So, um, and then obviously I did the video of Kaz's Airstream and that one blew up and um, and now my channel's come back down to earth. That's the way it, it works. It's like- What do you mean? Come to, you literally made deviled eggs in the <laughs> easiest way I've ever seen anyone make their own deviled eggs. And you still got 5,000 views and you just put that out a couple <laughs> days ago. Yeah, it's funny how your paradigm change it, shifts. Um, I used to judge a video, a successful video by getting a thousand views. That's how I judge a successful video. Now mm -hmm. I judge a video on success. Do, uh, do I get as many views as I have subscribers? And so for me now, if a video doesn't do 60,000 views, I'm, I'm like, okay, obviously that didn't appeal to uh, a wide audience. Although that's not what drives my videos because I still do silly videos like making eggs, but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, you have a really good eye to know what you can turn into content for your channel. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate now I can just put out, like you said, a silly video, although everyone was asking me to do that kind of video. So. <laughs> well, that's because everybody likes you. Since you started doing the live streams too, I think a lot of people are getting to feel like they know you on a whole different level. Yeah. Do you notice any difference with that? Yeah, that's that's what I why I love doing the live streams. I know some people don't like them, but uh, some of my audience doesn't like them. But um, I enjoy doing them because it's a way to um, connect with connect in real time with people that I see commenting all the time because those are usually the people that show up, the people mm -hmm. that you know watch normally. So it's really cool to get to know them, um, and I've become you know friends with a lot of them uh, in real life. So it's been really cool, you know, like Johnny's journey. Um, box mm -hmm. fan e, um, you know, it's been really cool to, uh, to, uh, connect with them in real life too. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So where were you when COVID actually hit? You were out of the country, weren't you? Yeah. So I did, I left, actually I left February of last year. I left right now <laughs> last year and flew to Peru 
and did 12 months living in a different country every month. And, to, and I came back March 2nd. I was in, I was actually last year at this time, I was in um, Cape Town, South Africa. And um, I flew back from Cape Town March 2nd and was going to visit my mother for a month and then head back out for another nine months overseas. And COVID, COVID was starting to, you know, starting to be mentioned in the news around mm. that time, but it wasn't, there wasn't even a case in uh, South Africa yet. Um, and there was only like a handful of cases in the U S so, uh, it wasn't really a big deal until about two weeks after I got home. And then obviously started shutting down airports and things yeah. like that. So where were you going to go? Um, so I was going to take a cruise over to Europe, get off in Germany. You want know, my Hawaii itinerary? <laughs> I'll try to, do, I'll try to do it quick. I was going to go to Kiel, Germany. Then I was going to, um, I was going to Tbilisi, Georgia for the Nomad Summit. Um, for those, I don't know if your viewers know who Johnny FD is. He's kind of a famous travel vlogger. He puts on a, on a Nomad Summit every year. And I was going to the Nomad Summit. And then I was going to, so that was in Tbilisi, Georgia. And I was going to Banksko, Bulgaria to go to the Nomad Fest. And then I was going to fly to Moscow and get on the Nomad train take it to Mongolia and then go to Malaysia, Thailand and a bunch of other places. So yeah, I had, a full, I had a full schedule. So are, are these places that you had been to in your military career or just places you've researched or heard about? Yeah. So there's a really, so I'm really fascinated by the idea of being able to live off the U S dollar or Canadian dollar in countries, um, that have a lower valued currency. Um, and I, I'm really fascinated by that. There's a mm -hmm. website called nomad list. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. No, but basically it lists like the top, you know, 500 countries for digital nomads. And it tells you what it costs on average to live there. A place like Chiang Mai, Thailand, you can live like a king or a queen on a thousand dollars a month there. Have amazing internet, eat amazing food, you know, live in a Ooh. I have an apartment tour over there where I'm in a high rise apartment building with a pool, a maid, and a driver. And my apartment was three hundred and eighty dollars American uh, a month. And so I was fascinated by all these places and I wanted to go and um and bring those to my viewers, places like Tbilisi, Georgia, which is a which is a city in the country of Georgia that um, has all, you know, has the beauty of Europe, except for, you know, you can rent an Airbnb for a month for $200. Whoa. Um, yeah. Banksko, Bulgaria is a ski resort, a European ski resort, but in the summer, there's no snow. Uh, it's in, um, in the summer, it's no snow. So they rent out these ski chalets for two or $300 a month. So digital nomads flock there because you can get a really nice apartment for two or $300 a month. And um, you can stay there, I think, 60 days. Um, so I was fascinated with the idea of, of, of being able to live a really cool life on just $1,000 a month and showing people how to do that. Um, because a lot of people think that travel is expensive, but to be honest with you, it's much cheaper to travel full time and live in places like Thailand, Bulgaria, um, Budapest and Hungary. Um, you know, those places that it is to, uh, live anywhere in the U S and Canada for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. I find that very interesting, very interesting. And I think that that is something that I would really like to experience, but I'm worried about things like, how do you how do you keep up with your your visas everywhere you go and the language I think is probably the biggest concern I would have. So uh, I'll address the language one first. So if you speak English, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. <laughs> People everybody speaks English um for the most part. That's kind of every other country other than the United States has a ton of bilingual people. <laughs> okay. Um, and so if you're, if you're going to a place like Budapest or you're going to a place like Chiang Mai, Thailand, if you're going to Malaysia, like a, a, a country like Malaysia, I think is a really good place for like training wheels 
to go to a foreign country because Malaysians speak English. That's the native language there. They were a British colony forever. Everybody speaks English. Um, and in the Europe side, I always tell people to go to Malta. Malta is a really unique country off the coast of Italy, but it's it was a British colony, so everybody speaks English. Um, so those are like my two countries on training wheels. But if you go to Budapest, everybody's everybody speaks English. In Thailand, everybody speaks English. Really? Yeah, everybody speaks English. So it's uh, the the if you speak English, you can go anywhere in the world. When I live, you know, I lived in. I, I lived in four countries last year in South America. I lived in Peru, Chile, um, Colombia, and Mexico City, Mexico. And I had no issue. Everyone speaks English. So if you if you speak English, plus we all have this little phone app called Google Translate. <laughs> and you can just talk into it and it, it works great. Um, or you could learn, you know, learn a little Spanish, you know. Um, well, you speak a little bit of Italian from when you were in the military, correct? Yeah, I was stationed in Italy for two years, but it was from 98 to 2000. So I'm really rusty. You know, I can, I can probably order a meal and, and have like a little bit of conversation, but it's very, very, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have a couple of questions. Actually, um, let me go back to the visa issue. Oh, yes. So I'm assuming most of the people on this live chat are from the U S or Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, People from the U.S. and can actually Canada even more, we have the most powerful visas in the world. You can go almost anywhere without having to get an actual visa. You can just get a visa on arrival, a tourist visa. In a country like Thailand, um, U.S. citizens get 30 days automatically and Canadian, I think Canadians might get more. Um, and then you can extend it for 30 days and then you can extend it again so you can get 90 days. But you only have to leave the country for one day so you can get on a $17 flight to Singapore, hang out in Singapore all day, jump back on a flight to Thailand, and your visa resets. You can stay in Thailand indefinitely. Um, a country like Malta, or I'm sorry, a country like Malaysia has a 90-day visa. So you can stay there for three months. Um, mm -hmm. If you go down into South America, uh, Mexico is six months for a U.S. Citizen, U.S. and Canadian citizen. Canadians, it might actually be more. You guys usually get a little bit more than us. Um, and you can go to Peru six months. You can go to Colombia for six. Like, visa is not an issue. I only had to get a visa for one place last year um, through an embassy, and it was Vietnam. And that's because of the relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam and the Vietnam War. It's a little bit harder for us to get visas, but you can get them. I'm, I bet you Canadians don't need a visa. You probably get a visa on arrival. So. Oh, yeah. gee, you just know so much about travel. It's just awesome. I'm surprised oh. that those <laughs> videos didn't get more traction. I think if yeah. you did some more international travel now, now that you're more known, I think you'd probably yeah. get a lot more hits on those kinds of things. I, th I think the re so the, the real reason is I'm not very good <laughs> compared to other travel vloggers. That international travel vloggers, like that's a very competitive niche in the YouTube. Like if you if you Google like Malaysia, like digital nom or nomad L Malaysia, you're gonna get these beautiful videos with the like you know bikini clad <laughs> bikini clad couple, <laughs> and you're, you're you're gonna get like really high quality drone shots. Really, you know, and that's just not really my my style. Although you're gonna get some really high quality drone shots in the future on my channel. But, nice. Yeah, but um, it's very competitive. Where the RV community, to be honest with you, is it's not that it's not competitive because there are it is competitive, but the, the like RVers aren't out there with ten thousand dollar cameras making YouTube videos. They're out there with GoPros and phones like me. Mm -hmm. So competition is much lower for the quality um, of video. So then it just becomes more about you, you know where travel videos is more about like, you know, making something that looks like it's on from the travel network, so. You know, I was gonna ask, I have this little piece of paper I keep moving around, because I did actually write a couple things down. I never do that, Kevin, I never do that, but I was worried I was gonna get all nervous. Um, <laughs> before I forget, I do wanna know now, you were in the military for like 20 years, and then you were a lawyer, and then you traveled, and you're in your 40s, so I'm wondering, when did you have time to get your education? <laughs> so 
So I, um, I, I got my undergrad in the military, just piecemeal style. Okay. Um, a class here, a class here until I had enough to get a degree. Uh, my degree is in business management. And then I, after I retired from the military, the U S uh, government gives military, actually almost any military veteran money for college. And so I used that money to go to law school because I never had like a traditional brick and mortar um, experience going to college. And I wanted that. And so mm -hmm. I, and I also wanted to do it. Like I started law school, I think I was 38 or 39 and I just knew I would appreciate, appreciate it more doing it a little bit older. So, so then how many years were you actually in that profession as a lawyer? Uh, two. Um, yeah, not that long. <laughs> I'm still a lawyer though. I'm still barred. I'm still, I'm still a barred attorney. And, um, I was a juvenile defense attorney for a year and a corporate lawyer for a year. So I'm just going to guess that there probably wasn't much job satisfaction at that time that you changed your focus or like what I really want to know is what was your state of mind or the things in inside of you that said, no, I'm going to do traveling. I'm just going to go and I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Like that's <laughs> some pretty big stuff to do. Yeah. I mean, so I, um, I enjoyed being a lawyer, to be honest with you. I really did. Um, it's like, it's a very like intellectually challenging job. And I really, I enjoyed that side of it, <clears throat> but it's also, it also takes up a huge percentage of your life. If you, if you do it correctly, um, you know, you, you really have to work 60 to 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was coming home every night and watching travel YouTube videos, you know, uh, van life videos, things like that. Mm -hmm. And before I became a lawyer, I actually had a YouTube channel on investing that was pretty successful. So I already knew the income earning potential of YouTube. I already knew that that was a viable source of income if you can if you can build a channel up. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I was one day a day I was just like, I, I really love traveling too, by the way. And one day I was like, why don't I just, yeah, why don't I just try? Why don't I just do that for a living? Like, why don't I figure out? a way to make travel my life and the way I make money. <laughs> and so, so this isn't your first channel. No, I use, I've, I had a channel. I had an investing channel. I had to shut it down when I became a corporate lawyer because there was uh, conflicts because I had talked about companies um, that I was representing as a lawyer. And that's just a big no, no, even if it was mm. in the past, Hindsight being 2020, I wish I would not have deleted that channel because I could have got a bunch of, I could, my channel could have grown a lot quicker because I could have got a bunch of those people over. I never showed my face on that channel though. Oh. So they wouldn't recognize, you know, they wouldn't recognize me. Um, and I've never, I've never had any crossover. I've never had anyone go, oh, I think I remember your voice from <laughs> so I would imagine you obviously you have a lot of knowledge when it comes to investing. Is that kind of how you created like a nest egg to travel? I know in one of your videos, one of your recommendations is to make sure that you have at least enough money for 12 to 18 months when you first want to yeah. go and do it. So well, Yeah, I think that's I think that's if you want to be a, a full time YouTuber, a, a travel YouTuber. Um, you need to have like, you need to have a big runway because YouTube is not like an overnight thing. Like you, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, uh, we're talking about like you introduced me um, and said, you know, his channel is really successful, but I mean, you, you just said, I saw your first video from three years ago, right? I didn't make a penny on YouTube until I had been doing it for two and a half years. <laughs> so well, not, not two, not probably two years, three months. Um, and, um, so it, so it takes a while, you know, um, I remember one of my favorite, um, van channels is, um, van city van life. And I was one of his first, I think I was one of his first hundred subscribers. Um, and I, I mean, I remember when he was homeless and like trying to put a van together <laughs> and he was DJing, yeah. he was DJing to pay for it. And so people look at him now and go, wow, that guy's super successful but it, he grinded it out. And mm -hmm. I mean, that guy makes a video every single day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I make one a week and like right now I don't have one for Thursday cause I've been taking uh, care of my mother. So I haven't really put one together. Mm -hmm. That guy makes a video every single day. <laughs> 
Like, How is your mom doing now? Uh, she's actually in the hospital now. Her, she took a turn for the worse, but now she's in the hospital and she's better. They're able to provide her um, care that I obviously couldn't provide her. So she's actually doing much better. I just talked to her a little bit ago and she sounded a million times better. And they're, you know, I mean, they're, she has like mm -hmm. people that know what they're doing, <laughs> taking care of her now instead of me. <laughs> Well, you had mentioned she probably needed an intravenous. I mean, that's not something that you can do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Unless you have that as a profession under your belt as well that you just haven't told us. <laughs> I have done them before. I, I mean, I was in I was in the military and I was stationed in Iraq. And when you go through this training, they teach you how to do an IV. Although I would like I wouldn't want me to do an IV on me. <laughs> so, but I have I, I have never done one on anybody, but I have done them on like dummies. <laughs> So, I had no idea. That yeah, but so I would cool. never, I would not want me to do an IV <laughs> on <laughs> myself. So you don't want me to do an IV on you. And that was years ago that I learned how to do that. So. Um, we had a question on when in the military did you work with UMCJ? The UCMJ? Yes. That's the Uniform, uniform Code of Mis Military Justice. I wasn't a lawyer in the military. So I didn't, uh, I wasn't, I didn't practice law in the military. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and Mike, tiny appendage, he is not going to say your name. I am not going to ask him. You'll watch some more streams and you'll know what we're talking about. But we did have some questions about the, the Nomad Summit and the Nomad Fest that you had brought up earlier. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'd never heard of them before. <clears throat> yeah. So um, there's a bunch of different. So when I first, so I decided to be, an international travel vlogger first. I was actually going back and forth between the two, whether I was gonna get an RV and travel that way or travel internationally. I, I miss international travel. And when you get into this, like like if you search the term digital nomad, mm -hmm. you will go down a rabbit hole and you will run into all these personalities, personalities that are out on the road, making YouTube videos, writing blogs um, and, you know, they have these amazing lives and they, and they live and they live those lives on like $800 a month because they're staying in these, it's called G it's called geographic arbitrage where you're staying somewhere where you're the currency you're paid in is super strong. So you can live on a king, like a king on less than nothing. Right. Okay. Um, compared to the U S right. <clears throat> or Canada. And, um, this whole, like, this whole, there's this whole subculture of digital nomads out there. And so they have all these events that they put on where they basically teach people how to do it. I actually spoke at, um, for those of you that know Story Chasing, Amber from Story Chasing, she has a course and I did a guest, um, I did a guest lecture or class on um, what we were just talking about, geographic arbitrage, um, how to like, a lot of people think that travel is expensive, but it really mm. is. It's really not expensive anymore. Um, you can use credit card points. I, I've never paid for a flight in two years and I've flown all over the world. I use credit what? card points. Canadians have a little bit more difficult time than this because American credit card companies have these point systems. And if you know how to like do them correctly, mm -hmm. um, you, you will never pay for a flight. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but my Canadian friends usually can't take advantage of this because your credit card companies don't have the same type of incentives for whatever reason. I don't know why. why. Some of them can get air miles, but our air miles, you need a ridiculous amount. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a couple that are really, I mean, I haven't paid for a flight in two years at all. Wow. Um, I just use air miles and I, I get, I, I accumulate them off just my normal spend, like buying food, you know, whatever it is. I'm, if, for those who have watched me for a while, they know I, I don't have any debt. I, I don't believe in debt. I only use my credit card to get free crap. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> free flights. That's awesome. Um, I, 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 did I answer the question? I don't, I, I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> no, the Nomad Summit. You had, you had. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so those are these are just events that have popped up around that subculture. It's kind of like our the RVing subculture, the van life subculture. There's this 
there's this huge subculture, this huge digital nomad subculture out there. And they have these huge events like Nomad Nomad Summit is a huge event. There, I, there's actually a bunch of them. There's Nomad Summit, Nomad Fest, um, Nomad Cruise. There's a cruise that's just made of all digital nomads. And they it's really cool because you know how you would normally go on a cruise and there's like shows and things like that on the cruise? On the Nomad Cruise, if you Google Nomad Cruise, you'll see it. On the Nomad Cruise, they have a bunch of educational opportunities like, like you know, there's, there's a, there's a seedy side of that subculture too, like drop shipping and things like that. And like mm-hmm. get rich quick kind of stuff. But there's also people who, who have just like, you know, there's people who like teach English online for a living so they can travel full time. There's people who, you know, there's, there's like a bazillion things. And so they teach courses on how to do that stuff at, uh, on the nomad cruise. It's pretty cool. And are all of these far away um, Are there any of these in North America? Yeah, there was uh, there there was a Nomad Summit in Vegas, I believe, la- like last year, a year and a half ago. Oh, so does that relocate around the world? Then? Yeah, it changes all the time. It changes all the time, which is cool because it gets you to places like Tbilisi, Georgia. I'm sure Tbilisi, Georgia isn't on most of the viewers' map as a place to go, but it's an amazing European city. You can get you can get like an amazing steak there. For two dollars, what? Like, yeah, like five star restaurant, um, and it's it's like Tbilisi. Tbilisi's nickname is the Brooklyn of Europe. It's just a really cool, um, a really cool city in uh, in Europe, in Georgia, the country of Georgia. So, huh? Yeah. Uh, and Banksko, yeah. Bulgaria. Nobody would have thought Banksko, Bulgaria, but it's beautiful. It's it's on this. It's in these mountains that are, you know, ski mountains, but. In the summer, it's like being in Colorado, except for you can rent a, I mean, you can rent a place there. You can rent a studio there for $120 for the month um, in a ski resort um, studio. You know, it's beautiful. So, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, we have a question. Um, had you ever met Millennial Revolution? Mm-mm. I have not. Okay. I have not. There's so many channels with Millennial in them that, I don't, I, I, I probably know who you're talking about if I saw them, but there's so many um, channels with that, <laughs> with that uh, name in their, in their uh, title, with that word in their title. So if let's say you weren't able to travel anymore and you needed to, to kind of park yourself in one place, where in the world would you want to stay? Man, that would be torture. That'd be the worst thing ever. Um, Oh man! I don't mean those hard-hitting questions. That Jeez. is a, that is just an impossible question for me to answer, um, because it, in my mind, like different places pop up in my mind, but then I'm thinking of the places that I wouldn't be, and it just makes me sad. Um, I always tell people Thailand is such a great the the culture, the food, um, the weather. It's just such a great place. So Thailand comes to mind when people ask me. Oftentimes I get the question, what's my favorite place I've ever been, favorite country? And that's another impossible question to answer. But I, I turn that question around and I usually say, if you ask me, if you tell me you can only go one place in the world um, on your vacation, where would I tell you to go? I would tell you to go to Peru. And the reason for that is Peru has everything. Yeah. Um, it has world-class um, surf beaches. It has world-class skiing. It has a desert. You can, you can sandboard one day, snowboard the next surf the next day. You can go and hike, um, ancient, um, ancient Incan ruins to Machu Picchu. You can go hike a beautiful, um, natural place like rainbow mountain. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the, it has world-class cuisine. Like it has amazing, amazing big cities like, um, um, Lima, but it also has really cool ancient cities like Cusco. It's like, it has, it has so much to offer. That's why I, I would usually recommend that country because there's something for everybody there. You did talk about Lima, Peru, and you had just fantastic images throughout that video. I watched that and I was like, oh, now I have to go there. I have to yeah. see it. Like It's so nice to see someone that's traveled to these places and can really give you a really I feel like with your stuff, I get a really honest picture. 
an yeah. honest representation. And watching your live streams, I really appreciate how you address every question. And you're so open about answering them all. <laughs> Is that tough, though? Uh, I mean, I'm not as open as you think. <laughs> I always dodge. I always dodge certain questions. <laughs> Speaking of dodging questions, I'll use this as my segue. You've seen it before on my stream. I always ask people about dating and all of that stuff. And I was going through your videos trying to find if you had anything in there. And there was one about, um, what was it, if, if a person's lonely or, you know, different things like that. But you never actually answer the question. At one point you said, what makes you think I don't have relationships? Yeah. <laughs> Someone said, what? No wonder you're a lawyer. Great way of dancing around that one. <laughs> how do, how do, you, do you date? Do you, how do you deal with that side of relationships in your travels? Yeah, I mean, um, I try to. It's, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult when you're, when you're the kind of traveler I am where you move a lot. Mm -hmm. It would be different if I was staying in places for a, a longer period of time. Um, but you know, when you, when you're first getting to know somebody and you like, you're, you're scrolling through your dating app and you, okay, I like this person. And they, they see that I'm going to be gone in two days or I've, or I'm already gone. <laughs> I've already, you know, I'm already oh, yeah. 200 miles away. Um, it, it makes it difficult. It's funny because I do meet a lot of people because they're fascinated by the story, but they don't really want to date me <laughs> because <laughs> I mean, I'm not around. So, <laughs> so are you a part of dating apps that cover different countries or if you're in a certain area, do you look up a certain app? Yeah. So in the U S I prefer Bumble. Um, it's just less like Tinder is a little bit seedy in the U S but internationally Tinder is just normal. And okay. so internationally, I mean, there is Bumble internationally, but you know, if you're if you're in a country like Colombia or Thailand, there may be three other people on there, mm -hmm. where Tinder is just global, and so, and Tinder is normal, more no, like normal. It's not as seedy. It's not a booty call like it is yeah. in America. Yeah, it's not as seedy as in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. So. Another one of your videos, you were, how, now how did that go? I, think I, I have to show this real quick though. I, I So yeah. I was going to pull up the app and just show you. And and the, this poor girl, I don't want to put her name, but this is the first, like, that's my, this girl just popped up. <laughs> that's a cool face though. I mean, she's pretty, she's not like. And this no is your dating app. So this is the new people trying to contact you or the new to the, to the site? I think it's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, but yeah, I, I pulled it up and I was like, whoa. <laughs> this is making a goofy, goofy face. Poor girl just got on YouTube. Um, uh -huh. but, okay, uh, now, if I understood this one thing correctly, you literally sounded like you put out an open invitation for people to stay with you in your van. You did a video <laughs> in November and it was the it, it was the one about being if people asked if you had been lonely or not and you had said you had said if you would like to join me in my van type in the comments hey I think it would be really <laughs> cool to camp with you Kevin. And then what did you put and then I'll, maybe I'll let you use the spare bed in my van. <laughs> think, Do you remember that? Yeah, I think that was more like your mil moose milk thing yeah I, I wasn't serious about that so <laughs> my question and, and i get that i do get that i'm just teasing you Did anybody I know, I know, I know. actually type in there and said hell yeah <laughs> like um i can't i can neither confirm nor deny that <laughs> oh shoot <laughs> darn you you're so so cautious so cautious no so I, I, are I, you I'm dating anyone now that you're traveling in the states uh no no, it's hard to date. It's hard to date when you're on the road. You know, I'm always it's like, oh, when you're not on the road. What's that? It's hard to date even when a person isn't on that's the true. road. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I can only imagine it being more tough. I think I always find that a curiosity. And I always ask most of the people that I interview if they're single and nomads, because I always think, what am I going to do when I get to be out there? Yeah. Right? Like a person... I think there's really cool aspects to traveling on your own. You get to always make your own decisions. But then I then I see, you know, couples and think, well, maybe that's good. 
but then couples relationships break up sometimes when they hit the road like it's just you never know yeah you know? that's one of the things like it, yeah i i see that actually a lot on the road where couples um couples try it for a little bit and then you know i mean it's like if you meet a fellow traveler on the road like think of the course of a normal relationship that you would normally have you don't end up like camping with somebody on date two <laughs> you <know? laughs> where you like you know what i mean i mean maybe you do but <laughs> you know what i mean um, it depends how much moose milk is involved yeah, just exactly. <laughs> um, yeah like it goes from it goes from zero to ten really quickly mm -hmm. and instead of like the natural the nat uh, natural progression of a relationship um, and the same thing happens with international travel too um you know all of a sudden you're like traveling with somebody <laughs> you know and mm -hmm. you know all like it's there's no build up to that and so um that that's uh you know, that's, that's a weird thing. I don't, um, I, I've, I've watched a lot of international travel bloggers. I have some friends and their girlfriend becomes kind of the, like also a star on their channel and then it doesn't work out. <laughs> and then they, you know, they go solo for a little bit and then some new girl <laughs> becomes, and it's weird. It's kind of, I think that's weird. Um, mm -hmm. personally, um, not, I mean, they can do what they want in their life, but I like that. I would feel weird about that. So. Well, I think one of the things a person has to balance too is how much do you actually put of your personal, personal, personal self into your videos? Do you do you have any rule for yourself with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, not really. I mean, if I'm comfortable talking about it, I, I mean, what I'm really careful about is putting other people that are in my life, whether it's family members or, or someone I'm dating, putting them out there without, you know, like they don't want to be out there. Mm -hmm. you know, if they wanted to be out there. They'd have a YouTube channel. They don't want, you know, they don't want, um, you know, cause I got family and friends that watch too. So if I'm dating somebody and, you know, I, you know, I don't, you know, so I'm very, I would imagine it puts a lot of pressure on a person. Yeah. This, it's, it's probably pretty weird. <laughs> It's probably well, there was a comment in the chat that maybe your mom will find you a nice nurse. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I did. I dated a nurse one time. She was. She was a wonderful woman. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I think this is a good question. How many subs have you gotten from being on those dating sites? <laughs> that is actually. That's probably the most beneficial thing about it is. Um, so I think one of the cool things about being on YouTube and having these videos it, for the person who matches with me, they can see me animated there that, you know, there's a difference between like pictures and then someone, you know, like their personality and the way they move and the way they talk, you know, we can all filter and we can do all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, take a picture from a good angle or whatever. Yeah. So when they, they can go to my channel and see what my personality is like, see, you know, do I have a, you know, a, southern accent do i have a canadian accent do i you know um they can they can see me animated so i think for them it's actually um kind of cool that they can see me um mm -hmm. see me animated so so do you put that you you do youtube videos in yeah your i got tired i got tired of like explaining it in the, you know the back and forth chat like hi mm -hmm. hi what do you do i'm a youtuber you can make money at that yeah, you can. <laughs> and, you know, just going through the whole thing. So I just put like, uh, yeah, I, this is what I do now. And th go to 30 and wake up if you want to see. <laughs> so, and so, so yeah. do you think you've gotten subs out of that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No question. I mean, some of them are in here, I think. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, people that like I, like I went back and forth on there, never really met, but they were like, oh, your life's cool. I'm going to follow it. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, we do have a question on how you came up with your channel name for those that you're a little bit newer to. Yeah. So um, like we mentioned earlier, I was in the military for 20 years. I um, I went on a bunch of deployments in the U.S. military. I don't know if it's like this in the Canadian military, but in the U.S. military, when you go on a deployment, you usually have a countdown to when you're going to return home. 
And so if you have 100 days, you'll say I have 99 in a wake up to make it seem shorter. And I, I started traveling internationally and I like to travel slow. And I knew I was only going to, I knew I was going to stay in a country at least 30 days. So that's where 30 in a wake up came from. Cause I was going to stay in a country 30 days and then move on to the next country. So, yep. <laughs> Very cool. Hopefully so how old were that. you then when you first started the traveling? How what? Like, the traveling part of your channel. When did you, how old would you have been then? When I first started this cha this channel? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm 45 now, so I mean, so I did it. Forties. Yeah, I, I did like probably 42 was probably my first video, but I didn't get serious about it until two years ago. So I was, you know, 43. So, yeah. So then how have you been supporting yourself until, I mean, it's just fairly recently that this has really taken off for you. you yeah. Know, you put all that work in initially. So how, how did you survive that? So I'm really fortunate. Like I mentioned, I'm, I'm retired military. And in the U.S., when you retire from the military, you get a pension and you get it right away. So I have a military pension. And I also um, did a, I also, I've all, I've always been an investor. I don't know why I, I, I don't know why I took to that. But um, so I have some rental income. I also have some other passive income from dividend type of stocks. And, um, and I had, I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I put, um, a few years of travel money aside. So mm -hmm. I would have a long runway. So I wasn't forced home. And my, my, my goal with my YouTube channel was to be able to fund my travels. So I, I mentioned I traveled for a year, um, living in a different country, uh, every 30 days, I traveled with a program called remote year and remote years fee for all the logistics of travel, the apartment, um, your flight, um, everything was $2,000 a month. So I said, if I can make 2000 American dollars a month, which is plenty, by the way, if you do it by yourself, you can travel for way cheaper than that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was my, um, that was my, my goal was to be able to fund my travels. And as of about six and a half months ago, my YouTube channel, um, supports my travel. So I don't have to use my retire. I don't have to use my retirement income, my rental income or anything like that. Um, my channel is doing exactly what I wanted it to do and making travel free. So. So you've always been on the go, like from 19, you've always been yeah. <laughs> traveling. And yeah, so it's definitely a nomad. Something that's ingrained in you. Yeah. I'm a nomad. I, I cannot like, I just, I can't sit still that, the worst thing would be to like the work, the worst thing for me would be to like have to stay somewhere like in the same house for 30 years. Like I, that just does not appeal to me at all. Even when I moved, when I was a corporate lawyer and I lived in New York city, I didn't rent an apartment. I would rent an Airbnb for a month and every 30 days I would switch to a different Airbnb. So I could go to a, di if you've ever been to New York city, there's a bunch of really cool different neighborhoods. They're all different and unique in their own way. And so I would, every month I would switch to a different Airbnb and I was like, that's how I'm just going to live. Um, and then I got the itch to travel again. And so, you know, but, um, yeah, I can't even imagine being. <laughs> well, did it ever cross your mind then to ever get married, settle down, have kids? Was that ever a part of your plan? Or just <laughs> I, I was married. <laughs> huh? I was married. <laughs> Yeah. And did you both travel or that was in the time you were in the military? Yeah, I was in the military. I was in my twenties. Um, I was only married for two years. Um, but yeah, I was married, uh, for a couple of years. I didn't have any kids. Um, I've always been like kind of indifferent about kids. I know that sounds terrible, but, um, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews and that's like cool enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> I like well, being I the cool uncle. Like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, it, it's never been something that I, you know, uh, that I felt like I had to do. I mean, if it, if it would have happened, then I'd have, you know, I would, I would take care of my kids and I think I would be a pretty good dad, but it's never been something that's like, I really need to do that. So your biological clock just said travel. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so good. Cause then you're doing what you want to do and you don't have anything to look back and say, what if, cause we've talked about regrets on this channel before and it doesn't sound like you have that. 
right? Like you're yeah. always moving forward. Yeah. I mean that, well, when I, when I got into that lawyer job, um, there was a couple different catalysts that I didn't mention. So I had a friend that retired from the military like me, you know, young, and mm -hmm. you have this military retirement and it's enough to live an awesome life in the U S and an amazing life overseas if you just travel. And, um, he got a, a blood cancer and died like two months after he retired. Oh, and then I got skin cancer. Um, I had a really good plastic surgeon that put it like on one of my laugh lines, but I got skin cancer. Um, and luckily for me, it was the most curable kind of, of cancer there possibly is called basal cell skin cancer, mm -hmm. but it was kind of a wake up call. Like you just don't know. And so um, I, there's a really cool, if you have Amazon prime, I think it's still on there. There's a really cool documentary. It's from like the year 2000. It's called a map for Saturday. And it's about this guy who takes a year off and travels. And, um, you know, there was no cell phones or any of that in 2000. Yeah. But on, while he's traveling, he meets this 70 something year old guy in a hostel who travels full time. And he had lost his wife like 10 years before that and decided to just travel. And he asked the guy like, if he's ever going to stop. And he said, my dream is to like die somewhere cool while I'm traveling. Like, so that that's kind of like I kind of like adopted that philosophy. Like I my goal is to like hopefully be in like Patagonia or something when I kick the bucket. Hopefully I'm like 95 doing it, you know? Yeah. So, um, but that guy's like my that guy sticks out in my mind. I don't even know if he's still I have no idea. Like if that guy is maybe he is. I mean, that was 20 years ago. Maybe he's 90 and he's still, you know, traveling Europe and staying in hostels. Um, it sounds like though, when your friend passed and then you had the skin cancer, you're faced a little bit with your own mortality. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like you, I, 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 don't, I, I didn't want to die <laughs> working 80 hours a week as a lawyer, even though I enjoyed, yeah. the, I actually enjoyed the work. Mm -hmm. That wasn't like, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, I didn't want to die doing that. <laughs> I wanted to die doing something I really, really enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. So, or actually, if I don't, I don't mean I want to die, but I, yeah. if I die now, like I, I want people to go, man, he was doing what he wanted to do. Good for him. I don't want it to be like, oh man, like I was with my friend right after he retired from the military, passed away, and I was like, man, he didn't even get to enjoy, um, you know the new his the newfound freedom he had um, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's one of my personal worries is that will i even make it to retirement and if i do will i even have enough health to be able to travel to go and enjoy things and right now i feel really personally torn because i mean i don't have a pension yet i mean i have a pension coming yeah. and in early retirement in 10 years but you know so much can happen in 10 years and, you know, and I've had those situations where persons yeah. face their own mortality as well with those that are close to them. And it's just, I just feel so torn. And that's, that's why I wonder, like, how, like, there must have been some, some kind of struggle at some point deciding just to, just to go. I mean, was it all easy in your decision making? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, for me, it was more of the peer pressure side of it. Cause I was in two occupations. I mean, I mean, lawyers are the butt of jokes, but I was in two occupations that are pretty well respected. Like I was, I was in the military or at least in the U S I don't know how it is outside the U S but um, I was in the military and that was part of my identity for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I became a lawyer, it was, you know, when my mom would introduce me, she would introduce me. Oh, this is my son, the lawyer, you know, yeah. Um, not introduce me as this is my son, the YouTuber. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, so it like, it, it was, my identity was attached to it. Um, mm. even though I wasn't happy, I was worried about, I don't know, like what other people would think about somebody. Um, I, New York city lawyers are paid ridiculously well, <laughs> but you work your rear end off. And I didn't know, I, I was worried about people, I guess, judging that I left that. <laughs> left you I know think that's reasonable yeah so uh that was the hard part 
for me. I just to circle back around to what you said, my I did this video about a year ago talking like or talking about how to travel full time no matter what your situation is and like gave up I gave like five realistic steps that I think anybody can take. And I think like step two, step one is like get out of debt because that's like the biggest thing yeah. that prevents people from doing stuff like that. But the second one was, you know, figure out if, if tra and I mean, obviously my focus is being able to travel full time. If traveling full time is your desire, then figure out a, a job to do traveling full time. Um, I have, you know, I traveled a year with 35 other people and half of them convinced their employer to let them work remotely. And now it's actually like, you know, all employers are letting people work remotely. So it's not something even that you have to explain to them anymore. And then the other um, half um, did something different. Like a lot of my friends taught English online to Chinese kids mm -hmm. um, to fund their travels. A lot of them started, you know, businesses. Me, I became a YouTuber. Um, there's a, a ton of different things um, like that. So I, I think like whatever it is you want to do, find a way to um, kind of design a career around that or be able to do that career while you're doing, doing that, if that makes sense. Ask Kevin about the time a random guy told Kevin that he was spending more time in bed with his wife than he was. <laughs> <laughs> Someone watches you a lot, I take Man, it. He might even be in this. He might even be in this. So I was, um, the first time I ever got recognized in public, I was in Utah. I was at a Best Buy getting a speaker from my RV because my speakers suck. And I was looking at them there. I was looking at them and, and you know, you're, I was masked up. It was probably in July or something like that. And all of a sudden this guy kind of got like uncomfortably close to me like, in my space. And I was just like, you know, what's going on here? And he was like, I got a bone to pick with you. And I was like, oh. I like looked over and we both got masks on. I'm like, he must, con he, he must be confusing me for somebody else. And so I kind of pulled my mask on. I'm like, I think you got the wrong person. He goes, no, no, no. I got the right person. And I'm like, okay. He's like, you're spending more time in bed with my wife than I am. And I was like, <laughs> and I like, completely pulled my mask off and I'm like, you, d I'm like, you got definitely got the wrong person. I'm not. Even <laughs> and he's like, he's like, no, no, no. We watch your YouTube channel in bed. And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did you just start sweating for a minute? There? <laughs> no, it was, I mean, I was just like, I, I was, I mean, I knew I wasn't messing around with some guy's wife. Yeah. Like, he, he obviously is confusing me for somebody else. So I was trying to like, you know, take my mask off so he could see that I wasn't whoever this person is he thought was <laughs> was messing around with his wife. Yeah. Oh, that just makes me giggle so much. I'm probably going to giggle for a while over that one. <laughs> Especially in Utah. Utah, I don't know what you know about Utah, but it's a very- It's very like, religious, isn't it? Yeah, and very, it's very friendly. Um, it's a very friendly play. Like, oh? Um, what's that? Okay, maybe I don't, maybe I don't know anything about Utah. Well, it's, what do you mean? So I mean, they're so most, well, many people in Utah are Mormons and Mormons are just very friendly and okay. welcoming and, and, um, and he was a Mormon as well. Um, Mormons are just really friendly people. <laughs> um, and I don't want to generalize people cause I'm sure there's some bad Mormons out there, <laughs> but they're, they're just generally very, very friendly and nice. And, you know, well, are very family oriented. We'll give the shirt off their back. They're very, you know, they're just really um, really friendly, friendly people. So I was a little bit thrown off uh, in Utah. Like I thought <laughs> this guy was like, you know, <laughs> it was weird. It was, it was odd. <laughs> so we had another question asking what branch of the military were you in? I was in the Navy. I, uh, I got loaned out to the army for almost for a year and a half. So, but I was oh. in the Navy. Um, yeah. So. All right. And then we have one more question. What did you think of Rio Secreto? So they're talking about those underwater caves in Mexico. Uh, I did, you know, I, I, they might be talking about the cenotes. I, I've never been to a cenote. So if that's what you're talking about, I haven't been. Uh, yeah, been that's a, I've, I've been there. So I, have to yeah, I haven't been there. I haven't been there. I was in Mexico city. Um, okay. I did go to some like, 
Aztec ruins and did a bunch of hikes like that. But I, I did like a hot air balloon actually over, um, man, I used, I, I practiced saying this place for my video. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not even going to try it now. <laughs> it's like an Aztec name. But, uh. So did you spend any time in like Nicaragua or Costa Rica or Panama? No, no. Those the closest to those places was Colombia, Medellin, Colombia. Yeah, which is an amazing city, by the way. I highly recommend Medellin. Um, it's Kate, not what, why does that name sound familiar to me? Well, Medellin, Colombia used to have a really bad reputation because it's where Pablo Escobar had well, his whole crime ring. Okay, that's um, that's but, why. But that was in the eighties. <laughs> like, the, and people in <laughs> people in Medellin hate that all they're known for is Pablo Escobar. And by the way, Escobar is like the most popular last name there. So like 20% <laughs> of the population's last name is like Escobar as well. So he's just one Escobar, um, <laughs> which, uh, so it's, it's an amazing city and it's very, uh, it's very, it's another city that's very affordable. Um, so I could ask this question. I almost feel silly to ask it because you're a man and you've been in the military and everything, but are there ever times that you feel unsafe or, or nervous about your safety and your traveling? Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously there's, you have to know your surroundings. Like I, I was in um, Mexico city and there are places in Mexico city that you, you really need to know not to go to, <laughs> but, but I could say the same thing. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is always in the top 10 most dangerous cities in the world. Like, oh. so I, I can tell you a bunch of places in St. Louis not to go to. Um, and so um, I think it's just like educating yourself on, you know, where to go to. I was in a, I was in a, um, I stayed in a neighborhood called Condesa and anybody who's ever been to Mexico city knows Condesa is like the Beverly Hills of Mexico city. So I was in an extremely safe neighborhood. Every morning I woke up and w walked to the Starbucks on the corner um, and then went to the churro shop on the corner <laughs> um, and had no issue. Um, yeah. I, so and in Asia is much safer than North America, um, Thailand, like you're like, there's like no crime in Thailand. I think there was like one, one murder, like over a 10 year period or something like that. Really? Uh, it was a crime of passion or something like that. But so have you been to like Bangkok? Yeah, but I, Bangkok is not my favorite. Uh, it's kind of, no. it's such a big, dirty city, you know, okay. it's a big, dirty city. Like a lot of cities are. Um, Chiang Mai, Thailand is amazing. It's in Northern Thailand. And I really love, um, I really love the beach areas of Thailand and the, in the islands off the coast, uh, of Thailand. Those are, cool. those are the places you see like in the brochures. Bangkok is, Bangkok is cool. I mean, it's, but it's like being in Los Angeles or, well, I or Montreal I or <laughs> Quebec, you know, I, I just had a friend from high school move out there and she and her husband are going to be there for two years. And I was thinking, well, maybe, That'd be my first really big trip. But yeah, you just, you don't know what, well, I don't know. You'll you don't know really how much you're going to get to do. Very years. Western city. Yeah, I don't want to go for, like, for example, when I went to Hawaii, and that was my very first trip with a passport, I didn't like it, but I was on Waikiki Beach. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I like, like Hawaii. it. It was nice to be there, yeah. but it wasn't, I'm, uh, it was, it's too busy and too, like, I, I wish you would have. I wish I would have known you then. I lived in Hawaii for nine years, so I could have told you where to go. <laughs> definitely yeah, right Hawaii. on the beach. Definitely did not one. Really cool stuff like toured Pearl Harbor and did a helicopter tour. We actually went right above, and you can see those ships under the water when you yeah. are in a helicopter over there, and some beautiful scenery. But where we stayed was just. I wanted a little more realistic of where we were. Yeah. Right. More, you're more in, in immersed in a culture rather than commercialism. Yeah. Yeah. Waikiki is like, that's the, that is the commercial hub of, of Honolulu, of, uh, Oahu. Oahu. Yeah. Oahu yeah. is the most commercial Island too. So, mm -hmm. um, although that's where I lived, I lived there for nine years. Um, I was stationed in Pearl Harbor. So really, yeah. Oh my gosh, there's just so much stuff about you that a person could ask, but we're already over an hour <laughs> and I really hate to take advantage of you, but I could probably sit and chat with you for hours. 
I mean, what are, I mean, I'm I'm just you know sitting here in Missouri. Actually, it's it's snowed, so I can't even do anything anyway. That's why I'm not in my van right now. It's um, um I'm in my mom's house. I'm taking mm -hmm. care of it. So um, yeah. Well, on your last live stream, I know you were distracted a couple times because the light was going off in your mom's vehicle. Did you figure out what that was? Yeah, um, it was. I think my cousin had hit a button. So. <laughs> oh, okay, because I was like, that's kind of like with someone trying to get in it, or no, no, no. my mom the lives door not right. No, my mom lives <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. Like, there's no, like, that's that would never happen <laughs> out here. Um, so Tim, with time for exploring, I believe he was in the Navy as well. Um, he wants to know what ships were you on in the Navy? Um, I was on the, I was on the Reuben James, which was a frigate. I was on the USS Abraham Lincoln, which is an aircraft carrier. I was on the USS LaSalle over in Europe. I was on the USS Mount Whitney over in Europe. I was on the USS Ronald Reagan. I was on more ships than that. I just can't remember. <laughs> I was on a lot of ships. Uh, <laughs> I was on more than I just can't remember. <laughs> I was the command mass chief of a of a F eighteen squadron that was on a bunch of aircraft carriers. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm supposed to ask, what was his rate? Uh, I, uh, rates like your job. I was originally a YN, and then I I don't know when you were in Aaron, but now they have. Um, they have they have the ability to, like the other services, go technical or stay leadership. And I went leadership. So at the E eight and E nine level, I was a command senior chief and a command master chief. So, so I just got a super chat from Land Cloud Adventures. Thank hey. you for that, Nate. Um, I'm supposed to show you the do epic shit, and then we're gonna ask you what's the most epic thing you're going to do in 2021. I love how he set that all up too. Hey. I like it. <laughs> Our, oh, I better take that off so it doesn't get in the way when we want to watch this. There we go. I'm a Thank little you. disappointed that it took that long to get to that. What? I, usually I see those happening all the time in your live chats. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Well, you probably pop in on the Saturdays more. Yeah, I must be blabber, blabbering too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. And if the thing is, if people were doing it all the time, we would have to keep pausing the interview because I would, I wouldn't be able to keep up otherwise. Yeah. Like, right? And I wouldn't want to have them miss out on that. But that do epic shit. That's a sticker on the back of my ambulance because yeah. I don't know if you know I converted an ambulance, and so I just I'm trying to learn how to edit. So I'm just playing with little things, keeping it fun because this started as well didn't even start as a hobby it was my brother teasing me about having the world's worst memory but i should document how i was doing my conversion and i was like i didn't think anyone would watch and now all of a sudden like i get to meet you for example on here it's it's just there's it 2020 was a really tough year for a lot of people but i feel like for me there was a lot of gifts in it and i think 2021 can only get better yeah no i feel the same way i'm i'm I feel so fortunate that I have like this community on YouTube because even like, I, you know, I talk about it all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm very much an introvert. Um, and, but you still get lonely. You mm -hmm. still want human contact. And to be honest with you, the live streams are very like therapeutic for me. That's why yes. I like, that's why I enjoy doing them. So. Right. Cause like I feel more social doing my live streams than I think I have ever been. Yeah. Like how long how often do you sit and talk to 60, like right now, 67 people? <laughs> yeah, I would, I wouldn't talk to 60. I probably don't talk to 60 people in a year. I well, think, even in my job, I do a lot of group stuff, but I mean, I can't do that right now and I'm working at home. And, yeah. and so this has just opened up the world to me and it's just, it's encouraged the dreaming that a person forgets to do. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah so I what are you dreaming of for 2021? I want to get, I want to do some more um, international travel. I want to kind of combine van life and international travel. I want to like, I'd really like to go to New Zealand and rent a van and drive it across New Zealand. Um, I think that would just be really cool to do. Um, 
And I, I wouldn't mind introducing van life to countries that don't really do it. Um, like Malaysia, which is one of my favorite countries. Mm -hmm. um, van life really isn't that much of a thing in Asia. So I'd like to introduce it to, um, to Asia. And um, I have one subscriber that is lives in India and he does van life in India. And that, and he's like the only person in India, which is the second most populated. He thinks he's the only person in India doing it. And mm -hmm. I, I find that fascinating. So. Well, give him my email. I'll interview him. <laughs> oh yeah, I will. <laughs> I will. Um, I, I want to thank Aaron Jemison as well. He has been dropping your link throughout the entire interview oh, so far in the you. chat. Thank right. I also have it listed in the description below for anybody that's missed out on that. Um, Mellow Nomadic Adventures asks, is Kevin on the app Clubhouse? Uh, no, I don't even know what that is. What is it? <laughs> I'm always, I'm always interested in a good app. <laughs> well, I mean, it's probably not a, I mean, it's probably not a dating app. I mean, like an app, like, I don't know what that, maybe that's like an app where you like find like places to camp. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Oh, and you know why you were laughing because you thought it was a dating app, but. No, I know that's not why I, I no, I thought it was more like one of those travel apps, like how we have, um, Boondockers, no, is it oh, like okay. those apps people talk about? I thought it was like one of those. I thought you were so laughing I at me. We teasing you about the dating stuff. I thought you were laughing at me like, oh, Kevin's going to get on another dating app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, We have a question on how many other languages do you speak? Uh, I I mean, English is... <laughs> I, I mean, English is a crutch because you can speak it almost anywhere. Um, Io capito un po' italiano. I speak a little bit of Italian, but it's not, it's, I lived in Italy for two years, but it was from 98 to 2000. So, I mean, I, I just don't have anybody to speak it with. So it's, it's pretty much dead. I just know a few things. Yeah. But that's the only language that you had. Developed. Yeah. I took I actually took Spanish lessons last year and I just failed miserably. That's on my <laughs> list of like, um, you were, you mentioned earlier that van tour I did with the $5,000 van. Mm -hmm. Well, that lady, her name is Bev. She's a super fascinating lady. She's, you know, in her late fifties, she owns a massage parlor. She owns a campground now actually. And she's just a super fascinating lady. But one thing I learned from her, she she has a list of a hundred things that she wants to do, and um, she convinces other people to make those lists. Like making a list of things that you want to do is really easy until you get past about twenty, and then it gets really hard. You really got to think. Yeah. Um, and but one of the things on my list of a hundred that Bev um, convinced me to put together. Uh, is learn to speak Spanish. So I, I need to revisit that. Um, the other one is learn to salsa. So I figured I can go and spend a bunch of time down in Latin America whenever this COVID thing clears up and learn how to speak Spanish while learning salsa. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And if you're an introvert, a couple tequilas will just help you relax. <laughs> <Just> yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Um, Ann Holland asks, how many of the countries did you visit that you had to drink bottled water? I almost always try to drink bottled water, no matter where I'm at in any, like in, in any country. I think that's just a smart move. Um, I, even in the, I mean, the U S we have problems with water. I mean, we had Flint, Michigan, right? So I, I always try to drink, uh, filtered water. Um, but I would say most countries that you travel to, you should do, you should drink, um, you should drink bottled water, even in the U S I, I think, uh, I think that's, a, I think that's just a why that's just a good habit to get into mm -hmm. and always be careful of, at bars of, I, um, ice because ice is where a lot of my friends have picked up some bad stuff. Cause the you, ice really is their regular it. water that they've developed some kind of. Like they don't have the same sensitivity to it that we would. Yeah. I think in, um, in, uh, I think it's Mexico. They call it Montezuma's revenge. Oh yes. So you spend like, some time in the washroom. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm very conscious of that and very careful of that. I, I mean, I've traveled all over the place in the Navy and I've gotten really, really sick before. Mm -hmm. And it's something I don't, I, you know, I, I don't want to experience. <laughs> so again, so I'm very conscious of that. And water is usually where you pick up those, those type of things. So you really, yeah. and ice cubes are like, ice cubes are where people pick it up because most people, if you're down in Mexico or you're down in, I don't know, wherever, or, or you're in Vietnam or something, you know, you know, to drink bottled water, but then you go and you order a Coke and they put ice in it. Well, that's made from tap water. Yeah. And so that's where people get sick. So. Yeah. You know, and this might sound like a crazy question to some people, but I've, but I've heard of this where you'll go to another country and like, you know, you're not used to anything. So like even a bug bite can yeah. have such a different reaction yeah. than when it happens at home. Have yeah. you had any of that kind of stuff? I've been lucky. I Last year I traveled, the, I only got sick one time. Well, I only, I only had to go to the doctor one time. I, I went swimming and I went swimming and I just got a really bad ear infection and it ended up being like something in the water, like some kind of like organism in the water, um, had, you know, caused the, the ear infection. Um, that was the only issue I had. So yeah, I, I've been, I've been very fortunate. Yeah. No, I, I do I, find it hard to believe that you're an introvert. Oh man, I am. I am very much an introvert. I tell people that all the time. Like YouTube is different because you're like, you're. I mean, I don't really. The only thing I can do in live streams really well, which is kind of surprising, is or the only thing I can do in public really well, YouTube wise, is live streams. I cannot make a video in public, like a normal video. I just like I, where people are watching you talk to your phone. Yeah. Yeah. But live streams, it, it's fine. Like I, like, you know, I don't know because I'm like interacting with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the live streams are fine, but like trying to shoot a video in public, I just never, that's why I was a terrible travel vlogger. Cause I couldn't do uh, international travel vlogger. Cause I, I had a lot of problems doing those kind of videos in public. So uh, but yeah, I'm very much an introvert. I'm, I'm on the heavy side of introvert. So so we have V's talking about um, something about a cook along. Was that directed at you? Were you talking about doing more cooking videos at all on your channel? <laughs> I'm sure. Now that you did the deviled eggs, that the eggs were already boiled. Oh, I've got this I'm great. Like laughing watching actually, that. I actually figured out this great van life cooking hack, but I'm going to save it for a video. I, 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 I am actually cooking something in my van. Like, like it gets, like, you got to heat it. But you're really legit cooking. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's still with the microwave, but it's, it's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all look forward to seeing that. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually super excited about it. I'm super, like, I was amazed, like how good this came out. So. <laughs> so being, if you look at the introverted perspective, what would have been the toughest part of travel other than the filming? Like, did that ever affect you in your travel? No, not really. I mean, um, yeah, not really. I mean, I, so if you know anything about like the Myers Briggs personality types, yes, I'm what's, I'm an ISTJ and ISTJs are often confused for extroverts because when they need to talk, <laughs> um, or be social, they can. And so I, I can always like, people are always surprised that I was a drill sergeant in boot in Navy boot camp. Um, and it was just because it's just acting, you know? And so I kind of look at it the same way. Like I just, when I need to turn it on, I can turn it on. Um, but it's not, it's not where I get my energy. Um, it, it's exhausting. <laughs> so, yeah. See, and I feel like in most situations, I'm an extrovert, but that's only when I'm in a comfort zone. But, yeah. but at the same time, I isolate myself a lot Yeah. before COVID. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah. I don't know what that is. So I mean, you might be one of those persons that are, yeah, you might You're be one of those persons that are right in the middle of being, um, being a, uh, introvert or an extrovert. You might be one of those, yeah. like I'm, I'm all the way to the left introvert oh like I'm, yeah i'm very like i'm very 
Um, people confuse being introverted with being shy. I think that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. yeah that's really confusing. Yeah, because I'm not shy. I just kind of keep to myself. <laughs> so Because <laughs> being alone is where I get my energy, which is why, like, living in a van is, like, it's just no sweat for me. Like, people are always like, don't you get lonely? And I'm like, no, no. Because <laughs> when I want people around, I can find people, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah. I know you're a minimalist, yeah. but some people do have questions about, like, have you saved any artifacts from when you're in the Navy or your travels? Have you yeah, accumulated so, stuff in the van? Yeah, so, I mean... When you're in the military, in, in the U.S. military, every time you leave somewhere, they give you a gift. And I had all that stuff. And then when I decided to go, and I had all the like keepsakes and all that kind of stuff that normal people have, things I bought in different places overseas. But when I really committed myself to minimalism, I I just learned how to let those stuff that those things go. And what I did was I just took pictures of them. And so I can always go back and look at the pictures and reminisce mm -hmm. about the stuff without having to be weighed down by the stuff. And so that was a huge, it, it wasn't easy. And that's the toughest no. part when you get down to those, when you get down to the, you know, keepsakes, family heirlooms, any, any family heirloom, I just gave it to another family member. Yeah. Um, I, I, I obviously didn't throw that stuff away, but all my military stuff, I donated, I got rid of it. So I don't have anything. I don't have uniforms. I don't have anything. I, I do have some like old rank insignia and things like that, but yeah, I don't have any, anything. Well, and you know, you grow up and you think, well, you know, you have to have stuff. Everybody has stuff. That's how you've, you know, you've accomplished anything. You have your car, your home, all this stuff in it. And then it's like, I have it. And nah. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I don't think it'd be easy to give it all up, but at the same time, it doesn't have the value to me anymore. Yeah. I, my my thing for me, and, and it's different for everybody, but for me, stuff kept me from doing the things I wanted to do. It, it kind of weighs you down. You have to worry about it. You have to store it. You have to, like, there, like stuff. I, I just didn't like the trade-off. I mean, I still have stuff. You know, I have, like, an iPhone 12. The cool thing about being a minimalist is you can just buy – you buy fewer things, but you can buy really nice things. <laughs> like, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, because number one, you're not spending as much money on stuff, but you can have like, you know, the stuff you do have that you, that makes your life go and provides value to it. Like for me, this, because I'm a YouTuber, like this iPhone 12 is important to me because it takes really good mm -hmm. video. You know, it's just a good, I mean, you've seen my live streams now with this thing. It's so much better than before. And yeah, so- it's fantastic. Yeah, so it add, that it adds value to my life and doesn't take up much space. So I I can get a really nice one instead of having to get like a cheaper phone, you know, because I don't have, you know, a fifty inch flat screen TV or anything mm -hmm. like that. But for me, it's like stuff impacted my my freedom, and I know it doesn't it's not doesn't translate that way to everybody. But for me, it, it basically weighed me down. Mm -hmm. Stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. all, you know, there's all, I mean, sometimes do I'm like, sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I had somewhere I could just go for a couple months, you know? Um, but I mean, I've, I've really solved that problem. I can just go rent an Airbnb for a couple months or I can yeah. come and crash at my mom's place or whatever. But, um, but yeah, for me, it was just, it just weighed me down. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I made a complete break from stuff when I left last year. I, Everything I own fit in one little backpack. Everything I well, own. Well, how long did you live with just that backpack? And you have videos about it, but yeah. how long did you have your whole life in a backpack? For a year. I, I would have went way longer too. I would have I, I I actually I actually went smaller. I traveled with a 30 liter backpack um last year for the entire year. And when I was when I came back, I got a smaller one, a 20 liter that was expandable to 30. But I wanted to try to travel with just 20 liter because a 20 liter you can fit on any airplane in the world underneath the seat in front of you. And you never have to worry about them trying to check your bag. Where a 30 liter, sometimes the airlines are, um, are, are have really small overhead space and they'll make you check it. And I hate checking bags. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> 
nothing worse than ch- to me than checking bags. I hate traveling with people that check bags too. That's why I never travel with people because I'm like, are you checking a bag? Yeah. You get your own flight. I'll get my own and we'll meet somewhere. Like, I can't travel <laughs> with someone that checks bags. But you've traveled in some sort of groups you were talking about. Yeah, it was the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> and also they would, all, since I didn't have a checked bag, they all wanted to use my check bag space, but then I have to lug the thing around to check it in. And so, Oh, it used to drive me. If any of them are on here, they'll know. Like I was just like, <laughs> I would hate that person for the next, the, re- the rest of the month. <laughs> I like, I like to be able to just show up at the airport, hop on the plane. When the, when everything's over, hop off the plane and go. Like, I don't, I yeah. like, I like that to be really, really seamless. And so I hate checking. I hate checking stuff. Well, you know, that sounds like another thing that you've learned through all your travels, just the convenience of having a carry on, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, uh, if you can learn how to do that, you will never go back to traveling. Um, I I mentioned I travel slow. So uh, I, you know, I spend 30 days in a country. So I realized right away, like, I can get rid of like shampoo. Well, when I had, I had hair when I first, if you <laughs> old video, I, had hair. I can get shampoo. Your older videos have it. If anyone wants to see yeah. what Kevin looks like with hair, just go check the farther yeah. back video. You see my YouTube audience is why I shaved my head. They voted on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I, I realized that since I'm staying at a place for 30 days, I, when I get there, I can buy soap, shampoo, toothpaste. And so when you cut all that stuff out of your bag, it, it opens up more space and just, you know, learning, um, you know, learning about like materials, like the stuff I wear, merino wool, how great it is in the summer and the winter and how you don't really need to wash it very much and things like that. Just- yeah. You've had that for for a few years back on your videos and there's a video I didn't watch it, but you, and the, the thumbnail, I'm going to go back and watch it. You're yeah. standing there and people are smelling your clothes. <laughs> yeah. I had some brave, actually it's this shirt right here. It's actually this shirt. So the, uh, the company that I'm a brand ambassador for had just released this. It's called a Raglan um, Merino wool sweater. And it's really nice. It feels like cotton, but it's wool. And um, they asked me if I would wear it for, you know, a couple of weeks and convince people to smell me. Because for those who don't know, Merino wool is antimicrobial. It doesn't smell. You can wear it for the, the, the CEO of Unbound Merino, the company that I am a brand ambassador for, um, went to Thailand with one shirt, one pair of underwear and wore them for a month straight in Thailand, which is like crazy hot. It was and his underwear made out of that stuff too? Yeah, ran a wool too. Okay. Yeah. He had his girlfriend smell it. Oh, so, that's a close relationship. <laughs> and they don't smell. And so I, I convinced, I mean, obviously I didn't do underwear, but I convinced, um, I convinced um, some people I was traveling with to be in that video and smell my shirt. And they were all like, you know, they were all kind of surprised that like I had been wearing it for so long and it did not smell at all. But I'm actually wearing because I love wearing shorts, but it's cold here, so I have shorts on now. But I have merino <laughs> wool uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> underwear, whatever they long underwear on underneath them, so I can still wear shorts. <laughs> Jeez, because <laughs> <laughs> full length pants just take up too much space, right? Yeah, I just don't let. Well, they do. They do like jeans are heavy. Like they're, I usually travel with one pair of jeans though. Um, people always ask me about shoes is the, the thing people always ask me about. So what I do is I, it, I always recommend this to people. You get a black tennis shoe and this is probably mostly for guys, but you get a black tennis shoe, you get a nice pair of jeans and a black shirt and you can get into any club um, with that. Any nightclub, any um, restaurant, dressing like that because your your black tennis shoes at night look like dress shoes and that's all that that was my biggest hack is i only had to travel with one pair of shoes so i would wear those shoes onto the flight and then i would have some flip-flops in my bag because they don't take up any space so i only really traveled with two pair of shoes the Mm -hmm. sandals and my black uh tennis shoes which i would wear i would always wear on the flight my black tennis shoes my my jeans um so i wouldn't take that space up in my bag so no. Yeah, Sorry, sure. I went off on another tangent. <laughs> no, that's awesome. This is so good. We're just like getting so much information. This couldn't be any better. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things in the. To be honest with you, one of my favorite things. This is really dorky, 
But one of my favorite things is like to travel with just one bag. And I, I really, I'm, I'm envious of this one guy who travels with, he travels with a bag about this big full time, like all year. And his bag is like this big. And I'm like, I got to get down to that. Like I got to get down, like figure out how to get down to that. So. It would be convenient. I, I don't know. I've never, man, I'm going to have to put, I'm going to have to make a list of a hundred things and that's going to be on it for sure. Yeah. Because I'm one of those people I'll go to like Central America or something. And I've got like a big thing, just of medications and stuff yeah. just in case I need it. And like some people pack their whole life in that spot. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm always over packed when it comes to that part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I traveled with people this year that had, I mean, they traveled with hundreds of pounds of stuff all year. And I, I was like always checking their extra bag. Cause they had, you know, they had an extra bag and I didn't have a take up a spot. So they would, they'd, they'd always be fighting over who would get my spot. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I don't, it's so, it's so liberating to be able to travel like that. And even if you're like, I tell people like, let's say you're going to go live in Thailand for 30 or 60 days. My advice to people is only bring a couple things because in Thailand you can go to a street market and buy five shirts and five pair of shorts for $15. And when you leave there, you can just throw it away. You know? Okay. Here's another question. They're smaller people. I don't think any of their stuff would fit me. Yeah. You can find it. Cause they're making it for tourists. They're making it for Western. I'm like five, eight and I'm not a little girl either. So it's like, I just, I would, oh, I would be so distressed if I tried <laughs> to pull that off and nothing would fit. I just, uh, like, I would, like there's plenty of Westerners it. that visit there. You would, you would find stuff for sure. You would find stuff. <laughs> I mean, if you went to a normal Thai place, you wouldn't like same with me. I'm almost six foot. And so I can't, I can't buy a pair of jeans over there or anything like that. Um, Cause they're just, they're just not going to have uh, legs long enough and they're, and they're much thinner. I'm kind of like big, like kind of bulky. And so like, it doesn't fit me in the, around the, I have like huge thighs. So they don't, it doesn't fit me in those areas, you know? Um, so um, yeah, I have the same issue. But you can get shorts for sure, like shorts and t-shirts you can get, which is what you're going to want to wear there anyway because it's hot. <laughs> well, I really like your travel videos that are the what not to do because there's some stuff in there that I would have never, ever thought of. Right? Yeah, and you those, don't need to insult another culture, but it's just yeah. it's just a lack of knowledge, right? Yeah, the, those were the – I loved doing those videos because I, I would have to research them and I would learn these things. Like I'm trying to think of some of the I'm trying to think of some of the uh, some of the ones that you just wouldn't you wouldn't know. Okay, like like this like this in Turkey means asshole. So you wouldn't you wouldn't say okay. Uh, not not that a lot of people would do that. Um, and I can't remember what country it is, but this is the same as giving the middle finger. Um, oh, yeah. And, is the middle finger an international kind of thing? No. Does everybody know what that means? No. Oh. No. Uh, a lot of countries, they point like that. They point with their middle finger. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's just so many cultural things. Like in Japan, like you never cross a crosswalk unless it's green. Like you will get chastised by the person on the other side. Like you, it's very much a rule-following culture. Um, even if there's not a car within 100 miles of – going through that intersection, you wait till the light says you can cross. Um, in a lot of Asian countries, uh, this is the case. You never wear your shoes indoors. It's mm -hmm. disrespectful. Um, like Malaysia is um, a country in Asia, but th they're Muslim. And so you never show the bottom of your feet. Um, that's considered disrespectful. Although you never wear your shoes in their house either. So it's kind of, there's some there's some interesting ones. Um, I so ran, with the shoe thing, does that mean you take it off before you go into the house, or you do like we do? You step in and then you take your shoes off. Yeah, there'll usually be a shoe spot. You'll see it right away because there'll be tons before of shoes. Before you there. go in. Yeah, sometimes it's before you go in. Sometimes it's like right when you step in the door. But but so it just depends on where you're at. Like a place like Malaysia, you can't have it outside because it rains there, like like torrential downpours, like every other day. So you can't have it outside that all float away, <laughs> but um, uh, so they're, they're indoor there. But if you're in a place like Japan there, it's, it, it would be, um, it'd be outdoor. So. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some fascinating ones, um, especially tipping. Like in the U.S., um, you know, we just don't pay our servers. We 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 for whatever re reason we came up where, with a system where the business owner can pass their employee costs off to the customer, and so we have this thing, this tipping thing. But in a lot of countries, like tipping is not a thing, and in Japan, it's an insult. So oh. you, if you try to leave a tip in Japan the server will chase you down. Even if you leave like 30 cents, the server will chase you down. It's just, it's insulting and it's just not part of their culture. Um, and then there's other countries like, Cro like Croatia where they just don't tip. It's not, their servers make a livable wage. It's not, they don't even understand that. <laughs> they don't under, they don't even understand the concept of it. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of the things are interesting. The funniest one I saw was in Iran, mullets are illegal, uh, are illegal. You cannot have a mullet, which I thought, that, which I think is like one of the funniest ones. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually against the law to have a mullet. <laughs> because oh my it, goodness. Yeah, I mean, obviously they have, pro, uh, you know, they have problems with Western culture. And when that law was made was like in the eighties when, when mullets all, were popular. everyone that played hockey had a mullet. Yeah, so they made they made it illegal, and it's still illegal today. So you can't have a mullet in in, uh, in Iran, which I think is fascinating. <laughs> oh my goodness! We even had somebody ask if you have a, sh a brand of shoe that you recommend. Uh, yeah. So I I really like um. Uh, let's see. Originally, I went on my first pair. I just went on Nike's website because you can design your shoe, and I just like completely blacked out everything, so they would just be nothing but pure black. So that was the first one I had. Nikes aren't very waterproof, though. So when you go to places where it rains a lot, your feet are always wet. Uh, and I wear merino wool socks as well. So, and so, is there anything well, that like what all do they make? Shirts, underwear. Yep, shirts, underwear, socks, gloves, hats. Um, I almost have my hat on tonight because it's kind of cold in here. But um, uh, they, they they make shorts too, but they don't hold up well. Like you don't want to get merino wool shorts. Get You, you want to get like I have mostly Lululemon shorts because they usually make them out of like things that are very similar to merino wool that are that resist smell, resist getting wet, things like that. So Kind of repel the water. Yeah, kind of repel the water. So what was the question again? Sorry. I, <laughs> I, so, I, it was the shoe recommendation. So you oh, had yeah. Nikes, but they weren't waterproof. Yeah. So when I was in Croatia, I'd never had a pair of Skechers, but I got Skechers in Croatia and they were like so comfortable that now I'm just like, I'm just going to always get Skechers. They were really, really comfortable. Um, and so, yeah, that, that would be my recommendation is Skechers. And they're more affordable too than some mm -hmm. other they're light and easy to pack. Um, yeah. Anne wants to know what is a mullet. And you don't know what a mullet is? No, it's too bad. Business in the front, party in the yeah, back. It's too bad. I, I, have, I have a couple photos when I was younger. I have a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've sported a mullet before. Well, it was the thing to do. That was just the way it was. Guys wore their hair like that. I, I don't know if you remember. And this, this came from hockey as well it was really popular to dye the top of your hair blonde as a guy. Yes. That was more early nineties. Yeah, I did that. I dyed the top of my hair blonde <laughs> and, so, and I have really black hair. So I had like, it was really dark on the sides and blonde on the top. <laughs> you're going to have to do like a retro video where you're just showing some of your history or some of your pictures growing up. I think people would get a real kick out of that. I made a lot of poor choices fashion. <laughs> No, at the time that was what people did. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made a lot of poor choices. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We are almost at two hours. This has just yeah. been way too much fun, but I think we probably should wrap it up. Yes, ma'am. I would say you could interview me at some point, but I don't really have anything interesting to talk about. I don't believe that. I would love to do that. That'd be fun. I, I've been thinking about doing that on my channel, um, doing some. Interviewing I've, I've never done any interviews. I've been thinking about doing them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would. So, I would I'm love not to. a full time. I'm not a full time nomad, so I don't know if that would fit. 
Yeah, but you you renovated an ambulance. That's super, super interesting, I think. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean it is. It's I mean, I bought mine out of the factory. Like I didn't do anything. I didn't, you know. Well, I want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank everybody in the chat that came and watched this. You guys are so great, so wonderful yeah. and supportive. Yeah, really it's, it's been amazing. Awesome. Yeah, really thank you so much. Work.